the BBC tries to ensure that its programmes do not treat people involved in them unfairly. The Broadcasting Complaints Commission considers complaints of unfair treatment and unwarranted infringement of privacy if the complaints come from the individuals or groups directly affected. Their address is P.O. Box 333, London SW1W, OBQ. Now on BBC One, John Craven looks at the issues in this week's Country File. This calf is just over a week old, and like a lot of human babies, he's been having tummy trouble. But the farmer who owns him hasn't been using drugs to make him better. Instead, he's been using homeopathic medicine. In this case, a preparation made from the bark of a Peruvian tree. And it works. Tonight on Country Farm, we examine the growing popularity of so-called complementary medicines in the treatment of animals. And also on the programme, Catching the Poachers, the row over who should pay to protect our salmon rivers. With up to a thousand village schools facing the axe, is there any future for the classrooms of the countryside? And the wheel of one of Britain's last working water mills could stop forever unless someone comes along to save it. Every farm animal has to pay its way. If one of these cows is taken ill, well, it's got to be made better again as soon as possible. Otherwise, it's losing money. But these days, there's increasing interest in alternative ways of treating animals, other than simply relying on the vet with his drugs. Michael Colley has been investigating. A true picture of rural harmony. Ram and dog working together. But beneath the surface, all is not quite as it might seem, because the ram has got lower back problems. And that's a drawback when you're a bit of a stud. As far as the dog goes, well, he's got muscular tension. Life can be very hard when you're a collie. But today, both the dog and the ram have got an appointment with an osteopath. Tony Nevin manipulates people and animals, in particular, their muscles and bones. This ram, worth several thousands of pounds, has strained his mid-lumbar region, which is affecting his ability to mount. They live up to their names. They're always battering into things. So their, their necks are dirty, great big shock absorbers. <laughs> Would you describe this as sort of alternative medicine, alternative veterinary care? No, it's complementary because we work, we work with the vet. For legal purposes, we have to work with a vet, whether it be a ram, a cat, a dog, a bird, anything. Now, at the end of a session on this ram, what will you have achieved? Reduce the muscle tension, allow the joints to have their normal spacing, therefore allow the joints to move, as they should, right from top to bottom, as a snake moves. The ram is definitely fitter and, you know, looking a lot better. And, you know, hopefully this season we'll be able to use him again. The collie also enjoys Tony's visits. Well, the vet's isolated a problem in the shoulder girdle, just generalised tension. And he felt it wasn't really applicable to use drugs on this dog. He's called me in. Could I have a look and see if I can get the muscles to release with manipulation? You you're working on stretching the muscles and, and getting them to just relax off, just gently relax off. Unconventional though all this is, the British Veterinary Association welcome complementary treatments as additional tools in the vet's armoury. Tony Nevin's local vets not only approves, but personally carries out homeopathy and acupuncture. The uh, acupuncture is very useful on arthritic conditions. That's primarily what we use the acupuncture for. Um, the homeopathy is probably most used, I think, on behavioural things, uh, skin problems, and quite a few different acute diseases like cystitis. And we've used it on road accidents, diarrhoea, vomitings, all sorts of things like that. And Nick Burton coming in to the diamonds, and he is another one who's taking on the corners. The 1993 badminton horse trials. Nick Burton on his 10-year-old eventer, Bertie Blunt. 
In this sport, technique is crucial, and in the preparation for a major event, one particular technique stands out. Known as the Alexander technique, it usually has nothing to do with horse riding. Well, I know normally it's something that's used in people more than ever in horses, but I found it very helpful with this horse because he was quite stiff and quite crooked in his work, and I found that he was able to move freely forwards and far more supple and more connected in all of his dressage work. Whereas osteopathy involves manipulating the body, Alexander technique is all about encouraging the correct use of muscles by redistributing the muscle tension. I'm just getting him to tune into my hands a little bit. So I'm watching the eye, because that is going to govern if he's, his attention is on me or not. And sometimes you do get a little bit of twitching as a muscle starts to release. I'm using my hands in such a way as to encourage a change in his coordination so that he begins to use his body in a way which is going to cause him less stress and less effort and therefore he can use himself much more to his full potential in a way that is more natural to him and was more natural to him before the weight of the rider disturbed his balance and coordination. But are people a little sceptical when you first suggest it to them? Oh, yes. They wonder what I'm actually doing. But then they see the results in their horse and, and then they're sold. We have to look at every technique that we can use to improve the performance. We can no longer treat horses with drugs during competition because that is now illegal. Uh, and with the Alexander technique, you're working on the balance of head and neck to the spine. And when a horse jumps, it uses its head and neck to balance it so that all the musculature will work in a nice pattern and produce a good jump. So, horses, dogs, sheep, all benefiting, it appears, from alternative veterinary care. But we've come back to the surgery now because right now, in there, Tony Nevin, the osteopath, has been brought a wild animal to deal with. This badger was savaged by terriers and has been brought in, rescued. Um, so they were actually sent into its set? Yeah. Mending the damage to the badger's back legs will take many months. Hidden away here in this quiet back room is proof that complementary medicine can now be offered to even the most unlikely patient. It's giving you a great sense of pleasure to be able to do this. Yes, it is. It's great. No amount of money could uh, reward you for, the, for doing this sort of work. Complementary medicine for badgers and for other creatures of the countryside. And now let's get up to date with this week's rural news. The future of deer hunting on National Trust land comes under the spotlight this week. The Trust's 2.2 million members are being balloted on whether deer hunting is humane and on whether there should be a further ballot to ban it. The director of the League Against Cruel Sports, Jim Barrington, says it's a disgrace that Britain's foremost conservation body allows this obscenity on its land. But the British Field Sports Society claims the anti-hunt pressure groups are merely wasting the Trust's money by calling this extraordinary general meeting. Britain is to get a new national forest. Approval for the 200 square miles of forest land was given by Environment Minister John Gummer this week. The forest will stretch through the heart of England and involve the planting of millions of trees between farms, towns and villages. 60% will be broad-leaved, the remaining 40% conifers. A national forest spokesman said it will be a national resource, a welcoming forest with new wildlife habitats. Salad growers in the UK are welcoming a Commons Agriculture Committee investigation into horticulture, including cheap foreign imports. The inquiry comes amid allegations of secret Spanish subsidies, which may have triggered a lettuce price war. The National Farmers Union says it's difficult to believe that the Spanish can produce, transport and sell at such low prices without financial help. There are to be new guidelines for the use of thatch from research funded by the Department of the Environment. The study will look at the potential of thatch for new buildings and cover developments in fire safety. The National Council of Master Thatchers Association says we want national guidelines that will encourage the thatching of new buildings. But Dorset Fire Brigade says too many thatched roofs together could present a risk. <laughs> One of the favourite characters in country folklore is the old-time poacher, a kind of Robin Hood figure who took from the rich to feed the poor. But those days are long gone. 
Today's poacher is more likely to be a hardened criminal who'll use nets and gaffs and poison and even sometimes explosive to plunder the salmon. Policing the poachers costs almost five million pounds a year and the government is anxious to reduce that bill. But would that then open the floodgates to the poachers? Rupert Seeger has this report. The limited number of fish available without control, very soon they'd all disappear. If they had a free reign, there would be nets, all sorts of poaching up and down the river, and the fish just wouldn't return to spawn. Some people like me, there wouldn't be any bills. Some keeping the money job. The angler, the bailiff, the poacher, and the law, a mixture that's caused strife for generations. Today, however, both sides are highly organised. Water bailiffs employed by the National Rivers Authority look more like soldiers as they go out on night patrol. Unlike Britain's armed forces, the bailiffs' jobs are under threat because of government cuts. Night after night, the bailiffs are out trying to protect the country's rivers and fish stocks. Oh, will you read me over? Yeah, go ahead, I'll start. This is the River Tyne at Hexham. Now, this is possibly one of the best salmon fishing rivers in England and one of the best places to catch poachers. Using army issue night sights, the bailiffs scan the river, hoping to catch the criminals in the act. Yeah, we've got uh, one guy on the opposite bank to us who's uh, just walked out with the buses and standing on the riverside. We think there's another guy in the buses as well. Right, no problem. Stand by. One uh, radio call and an arrest team yeah, begins to move in. Such military efficiency may seem over the top, but it's necessary. The poachers we're dealing with today are usually related or have close links with the criminal fraternity. Uh, I'm talking about people who are involved in ram raids, uh, armed robberies, um, burglaries, talk and that's taken without owner's consent. But poaching's just another facet to the criminal side. So being a water bailiff is a pretty dangerous job then? Um, Yes, we, we do get threats of violence, um, threats made to our property and stuff like that, and there have been incidences where bailiffs have been hurt. The modern poacher is not content with the odd fish. They want them all. Netting an entire stretch of the river, two men can catch more than 100 salmon. A thousand pounds or more for a few hours' work. The fish don't stand a chance. This self-confessed poacher may be thought of by some as a romantic figure, but for Keith Hall, poaching is simply a business. So good, the Inland Revenue sent him a bill for £30,000 in back taxes. They don't care that poaching is illegal, nor does Keith. I'm not really interested in justifying it to anybody else. I can justify it to myself. And I don't believe that the fish belong to any other person until they're caught. So... But if you're catching them in someone else's river, or off someone else's riverbank, is that wrong? What? But that river doesn't belong to anybody, as far as I'm from. No, I don't consider it belong to anybody. What belongs to them? It can't be that water, because that water's gone that way. I mean, is it their water? I just know. Whose water is it in two minutes' time? Because that water's gone down the way. It's moving. What does it own? They own the river bed. The only reason that they're interested in owning the river bed is because they can make money at the selling the sporting rights for the salmon. If the sporting rights for salmon was valueless, they wouldn't be interested in this river. Illegally caught salmon like this are uncovered all too often in restaurants and shops. During 1993, there were more than 300 successful prosecutions for poaching from rivers. But poaching is not stealing if the fish are wild. The offence comes in the way it's done. The law-abiding angler buys a licence for £45 a year and also pays the owner of the fishing rights. Poachers are unlicensed and cash in at the angler's expense. That's what annoys me, that the poacher is getting money for it, money for taking the fish. We don't look at it as poaching now, we look at it as theft. It's not theft in law, though, is it? It's not theft in law, no. Perhaps it should be. The question is, who should pay for the policing of our rivers, streams and lakes? All those water bailiffs, it's an expensive business. In England and Wales, the NRA spend between four and five million pounds a year trying to prevent poaching. Now, most of that money comes not from anglers, but from the general taxpayer, but not for long. Government grants have already been reduced by 
and more cuts are expected. Some bailiffs may have to go, leaving rivers and the fish for the poachers. Well, now with the weekend in mind, let's find out what the weather's going to be like. Here's the country file forecast. Our weatherman tonight is John Ketley. Good evening to you. Well, thankfully, we've lost those hot and stifling conditions of yesterday with the temperature in the low 90s Fahrenheit. And for the next few days, more like normal, really, for this time of the year, for this country, into the low 70s Fahrenheit. With a lovely ridge of high pressure coming across all parts of Britain as we head towards the weekend. And that's good news, of course, for the 123rd Open Golf Championship taking place at Turnbury. It starts tomorrow in bright weather. It finishes in the rain. But, sadly, it will be rather difficult uh, playing later in the afternoon. But later on, then we're going to find a good deal of sunshine coming through during Friday and Saturday. I think then temperature up to 20 degrees once again. And the wind's never really much of a problem. Lots of sunshine. But later on Sunday, perhaps, towards the end of the round, I think we're going to see a little bit more rain returning from the west. Well, as the chart for Thursday, then we can see a little ridge of high pressure across the country and this next weather system rolling into far western parts as the day goes on. In fact, later on tomorrow, we'll find a band of cloud and occasional rain pushing south across northern England and down fringing the Irish Sea into much of Wales and the far southwest, in fact, by midnight tomorrow night. But plenty of sunshine during the morning, that cloud rolling in later on, and just the chance of a shower in this southeastern corner, but most places even here will stay dry. Temperatures tomorrow up to 22 to 25 degrees across many central parts of the country, rather cooler and breezy up in the west of Scotland. That weak weather front coming south during Friday is a band of cloud and just a little bit of rain, some sunshine ahead of it, plenty of sunshine coming on behind, just one or two showers up in the far north of Scotland. Then Saturday looks like being a dry day everywhere, a pretty warm one too with bags of sunshine, but to end the weekend more rain returning to the far northwest. And that's it from me. <laughs> When term comes to an end next Thursday here at Grendon Village School in Warwickshire, that will be the end of lessons forever, because after 123 years, this school is being closed down. And another 1,000 village schools all over the country face the axe under government cutbacks. It's a numbers game much more serious than any in the playground, with children as the stakes. The problem is surplus places in the classroom. Our schools could handle another one and a half million pupils, and the missing numbers are costing more than 300 million pounds a year. Rural areas are suffering most. They've got the smallest schools, and the simplest solution is to shut lots of them. But to many rural families, this logic is simply not acceptable. In the village of Wolverton in Warwickshire, the churchyard is a good place for the juniors to study local history. But their school could soon be part of that history. It's next on the list for closure. But it won't be going without a fight. Parents of the 60 juniors and infants are mounting a passionate protest, arguing that closing the school will tear out a vital element of village life. Last week, angry parents confronted local politicians. Small good school here that we could send our children to, and now we discover that we've got to get them somewhere else. The choice you're giving them is to go on a bus or in a taxi. And I taught for eight years in a school in Warwickshire where the children went to school on a bus. I wouldn't have a five-year-old mine going on a bus or in a taxi. Here, here, here. Put forward this front that this consultation is to consult the parents of the school about their school, and yet they fail to give a single answer to a, to a number of very direct questions. Well, in Warwickshire, we have uh, one in every five of our school places is empty. And we're faced with a difficult choice of deciding whether to spend our money on empty school places or on the education of children. The County Council has taken a decision to reduce the empty school places by just 30% and to plough that money back into children's education. By the turn of the century, very few counties will have any surplus places, even if we took no more places out now. And of course, soon, somebody is going to say, let's give all children nursery education, and if you don't keep the places, you won't have anywhere to put the nursery children. The future of Wolverton School will be announced in September. If it does close, the saving will be just £20,000 a year. So what can parents do if they want to keep their children's education within their community? One option is to run the schools themselves. In most cases, success has been short-lived, but there are a few happy endings. 
Eight years ago, this village school at Ticknell in Derbyshire was closed down, but the parents took over and now it's thriving. Almost 60 children attend what's now become an independent, non-fee-paying, person-centred cooperative. But it's still very much the village school. Grace, would you like to buy those two bananas? There's a fortunate combination of teachers who passionately believe in small schools and parents who've been prepared to do much more than just a school run and occasional fundraising. Some help with the teaching, while every parent contributes in some way towards the £45,000 a year which the school needs to keep going. They even run a craft shop at the local stately home, and all the profits go to the school. Parents organise a rotor to work for nothing behind the counter. We do it because we want to be involved. We want to be involved with the children and we want to know what they're doing. And to be honest, the only way that we can run the school is by having the shop and being involved. Though many country people regard it as nothing short of a scandal that parents should be forced to pay out to keep a village school going, this one is thriving despite all odds. It's a very carefully worked out education which we do with the backing of a large number of educationists and is centred on the individual child and the needs of that child. And the second thing is enormous determination and hard work by the parents. A few miles away, along similar lines, is another pioneering school keeping education within a village. Willington Secondary School has only 13 pupils and wants to set up a chain of small schools linked together to share facilities. For most children, there's no choice but to be driven to the nearest, bigger and usually urban school when their little village school closes down. To many politicians and administrators, it's the sensible solution. Well, that would be an urban view. Uh, and the problem with uh, schools in the countryside is that they have suffered since the war from that view of urban scale. And the simple answer that a countryman would give you is that when they look around them, then about the only state expenditure they can reasonably expect is upon their village school. Uh, and they would argue that there is no street lighting and so on and so forth, and that is their one return upon their taxes. At Grendon, where we began our report, the children sing their school song for almost the last time. In September, the 42 pupils here will be sent to 11 other schools, and part of a country community will die. To the people of Grendon, it's unforgivable, and that same sense of outrage exists in hundreds of villages where schools are under threat. If you feel strongly about this, write to us at this address. Village Schools, Country File, BBC Pebble Mill, Birmingham B5 7 QQ. Scattered around the countryside, there are dozens of old water mills. Here, on the banks of the River Avon in Worcestershire, there's this one, which has been derelict for 70 years now. In the heyday, these places were vital for the milling of flour, but they were put out of business by improving technology. In Wales, though, there is one water mill that's still going strong, for now at least, because as Shuri Ghost reports, unless someone saves it, it could soon close forever. Imagine what it would be like to own seven acres of nature reserve with otters, polecats, mink, birds like the red kite and kingfishers, plants like the marsh sankfoil and the West Wales speciality, the world caraway, even one or two types of orchid. But best of all, this centuries-old, fully working water mill. You'd think that having a place like this would be like owning a gold mine. By turning it into a tourist attraction with a tea room and landscaped gardens, it would attract swarms of paying visitors. And when they'd all gone home, you'd have it all to yourself. Well, that's what Malcolm and Wendy Beeson thought when they chose to invest their life savings into a small corner of Dovard. And they restored this unique wooden watermill tucked away beside the river Anech in Kriegerbar. When we first saw it eight years ago, it was in quite a sobby state. And in fact, we went away that first time saying somebody should do something to save that mill, but not us, there's far too much there. And then six months later, we were here, and I never quite understood why. 
We did our calculations for the first four years. Everything was on schedule. Trade was improving year by year, but then came the recession. In the last two or three years, the number of visitors has dropped off. Until now, really, we've reached the point where there aren't enough people through the door to help support the mill. So we're not able, really, to guarantee its future. When you think of a turnover of, say, £24,000 a year, you've got to take off at least half of that for the food that you're selling, the goods you're selling and using. So it leaves you a gross profit of about £12,000. And by the time you've paid £2,000 for insurance, £2,000 for advertising, the business rates, the repairs, the maintenance, there isn't much left. Malcolm and Wendy are dreading having to sell their property because unless the new owners care about it as much as they do, it'll all just fall apart. If the mill doesn't keep working, the water wheel will eventually disintegrate. And the mile-long leet or ditch which feeds this mill pond needs to be drained and cleaned out twice a year. It's back-breaking work. They're not getting any younger and they can't afford to pay anyone else to do it. Helen knew it is very exciting mill for two reasons, its age and its completeness. The Romans were certainly here and from my point of view as a specialist, the exciting thing is that a lot of it is very early mill writing practice. If you have a look around you can see that the whole thing is built of timber. If you look down here you can see the wooden shaft for the water wheel. In latter years they made them of cast iron but here we are, we have an early wooden one. The Felin Newith closed down. I think we would have lost a very early, complete and very interesting mill writing practice. I'm afraid it may be lost to the nation. And something like this really is too important to be at risk like that. It shouldn't be vulnerable. But there's no more we can do. We've tried. It would be nice to think that my grandchildren and their grandchildren even could come and see this. It's something that's unique in, in Wales, well in our part of Wales anyway. It is, it's criminal to, to close a place down like this. The people of Wales should stand up and say, well, we want it kept. The crying shame if this went, it shouldn't be allowed to go. Something should be done, either some voluntary support or something, or even putting these prices up. Because for £2.50, it's too cheap. <laughs> it really is. Why can't the National Trust help? I wish we could. Unfortunately, it all comes down to cost at the end of the day. It's not only the cost of acquiring a place like this, but it's the important ongoing costs, the revenue, and the amount of money that one needs to raise to keep people in full-time employment in a place like this. We accept that the mill itself is very important. Of course, there have been a lot of changes. Indeed, before Malcolm and Wendy took the property over, there had been a lot of changes. So, possibly the historic integrity of the place has somewhat been uh, blurred and smudged as well. August the 26th, 1899. Just reading some of the graffiti on the door here, but it's far more interesting than the usual scribblings because this links the mill with early Welsh colonists who went to settle in Patagonia in South America. Now, they went out there in 1865, and a few years later, some of their children came back to Wales to visit. And one of them was a man called Cyrus Evans. He was the grandson of the local miller at the time. And like travellers before and since, he's left his mark here. His name, his weight, and just above it, a poem. I now leave the mill looking for a better place in the land of my birth in far-off Patagonia. So when the last coachload of visitors leaves Velin Neweth and the Beesons are forced to pack their bags, what will become of the mill and all its history? Only time will tell. Judy Gosh and an old mill by the stream. And that's all tonight. Don't forget our weekend edition on Sunday at 12 noon. But for now, goodbye from Country Park. More than 50 years ago, with Hitler threatening to invade, this man was an undercover agent in a resistance network of farmers, gamekeepers and other country people set up on the orders of Churchill. They operate from underground bunkers if the Germans were victorious. Next Wednesday on Countryfile, the story of Britain's secret rural army.